Uh, well, this is a real treat for me, a lot more interesting than what I do day to day in the White House briefing room. I'm here with uh, the two most powerful women in sports. Uh, so, uh, very exciting. And not only um, are you at the top of a prof profession that we see, you know, it's largely male dominated. I mean, the NFL and NASCAR got to be, not only is professional sports male dominated, but those two sports uh, particularly. Uh, but you're also both doing very innovating, thing, innovating things in the side of kind of business and community development side of sports. But first, I've got to start with women in sports. Rita, yeah. just come right out and tell us, what's it like <laughs> to be the boss of a 350-pound offensive lineman? Uh, what is that relationship like? I mean, well, can we... Uh, I'm older now. First of all, <laughs> I'm also in a family business, so when I started, um, a lot of the people that work for us now, I was you know, a kid. I was eight years old when my grandfather bought the team. So it's, you know, it's a difficult thing in, in terms of that some of them have known me when I was a child, but the players now are younger than me. And so I think of them, it's more of a cousin kind of relationship. They're clearly not my children Some in any way, shape, or cousins, form. Yeah. No, but they're big guys and they're larger than life and they have big hearts and they, they do a lot in the community and they do a lot on the field to make our fans proud. So I'm, I'm uh, very blessed to be around all these big guys. And, and you have a very different approach than some of the other owners. Uh, I mean, and just, just to pick a name, Dan Schneider, uh, uh, <laughs> Jerry Jones. Um, I mean, what, what, what is your, I mean, you know, Jerry Jones you see up there in the owner's box kind of, kind of like living and breathing every play and kind of micromanaging the team. Uh, what's your approach? Um, the beauty of all the leagues is that they are a combination of all the teams and particularly the team owners and their personalities. So I'm, I'm most affectionate about the NFL because I've been with that league the longest. And they have such diverse backgrounds. Um, Jerry was really instrumental in pushing the league in a marketing direction when he first came in. And sometimes when you push things, you ruffle feathers, and we're very structured in the NFL. And I appreciate that structure, but I also really appreciate that we can change and adapt to what our fans want. And if you're the owner and you bought a team, you, you can run it as, as you feel. But we're also very collaborative in the business of football. People see only the competition because they're watching the games. And Jerry is very competitive. And, yeah. and he has that role where he really cares about picking the players. And, and that's his prerogative. Uh, for me and my family, we have so many different companies. I really feel it's the general manager's responsibility. And they have that autonomy to be powerful and make their own decisions. But uh, the collaboration that happens on the league level is so important and some people might think that that's more of a feminine trait but that is the strength of the league is the parity, the unity that we have when we make decisions. We discuss it, we argue, we fight fearlessly, fearlessly for our beliefs and yet we all know that we're moving forward in the same direction. So, so Lisa, you, you, NASCAR, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the fastest growing sports, um, we, again, we think of it as kind of a male-dominated area, but what, what, what we were talking earlier, what's interesting is how important women are to the bottom line of NASCAR. Well, it's changing, too, and I think uh, that you bring up a good point. Sometimes it's thought of as a traditionally male-dominated sport, but I started in the 80s um, with NASCAR. It is a family business, and I've seen dramatic changes, not just on the track. I know that ev everybody probably has heard of Danica Patrick. She has great star power, and she's really come on the scene and given NASCAR, I think, a whole different face, which is terrific, but there are also some up-and-coming stars as well that are female and really making a positive impact. But it's not just on the track, which you may be more familiar with, it's also the business side, what's going on behind the scenes, what's going on in the boardroom, engineers, NASCAR officials that are out on pit road and really participating and hands-on in the sport. So dramatic changes and really making a difference for all of us. And what about your fan base? Our fan base is about 45% women, and I think that surprises people a lot of times as well, but we have a very strong female fan base. So, uh, obviously, Rita, you've come through. It's been, a, it's been a pretty rough year for the NFL. I mean, it's been a great year for uh, ratings of, uh, and, and, and for the bottom line, but it's been a rough year on, on the, you know, certainly on the uh, public relations front. Do you think that the NFL could have come through uh, some of what we've been through this year uh, looking better if there had been more women uh, in leadership in the NFL? Well, Lisa and I are biased. We think that if, women, <laughs> if there are more women involved in the conversation, then, then that does strengthen every conversation. I think it's very important that we have a role that we can mentor and we can pull up others. 
And, and also, I think because everything is so focused on the, on the men that play the game that usual, the usual people don't understand that there are a lot of women, particularly on the club level, where you're, you're actually impacting and have the face-to-face -face interaction with our fans and our players and our community. So what I appreciate are those feminine traits that have resulted from this. Um, you can't go through Katrina and not turn a negative into a positive. So this is a very important time for us to discuss social issues. And women tend to be more collaborative, empathetic, and share more and embracing people that, that deal with tough issues but keeping them within the family and dealing with those issues and improving society as a whole, I, I think that we will see more women involved and we will do better. And, and how important, so you, you're, it's obviously, it's, it's sports, it's entertainment, um, but how important is that kind of role model uh, function that sports play? I mean, you know, kids, and not just kids, but you know, look up, uh, you know, to, to your players, to your drivers, and. Mm -hmm. Uh, see them as more than just, you know, somebody going out and competing on a given day. Well, um, when I would like to go back too to what we're all about. And when you talk about women in our sport, our fan day, when you arrive at the track, it's a full day of activities, not just for the, the male that's going to watch the, the races, but also the female fan sport so you're trying to entertain families all day long and provide great value and Rita talked about a different perspective so I think when we have women that are in the business side of it we can also discuss what's important to the fan from our perspective and you know what's going to bring that family in and what's going to attract that family to come and spend all day with you a lot of opportunities and options out there and I think it's up to us to understand that and to be able to deliver the guest experience for our fans so, but just to touch on the youth programs, um, NASCAR mm -hmm. and football and basketball, we also have the, the New Orleans NBA. Pelicans and the NBA. Um, so much that we've done in terms of building grassroots programs, whether that's the fields and the courts that go in, but unifying our community in that way. Um, one of the things I've been very proud of is that it used to be they were most interested in the player. And then after we won the Super Bowl ring and I had my ring on my hand, <laughs> it was nice. remarkable how kids would run up to me in the ring instead. And so for little girls, I could say, see, you don't have to be a football player to get a ring. You can be a girl, but even mm -hmm. for the boys, if you stay in That's school awesome. and you get a job, you can be a part of the overall business and the plan of that. And it really just takes speaking to them and, and talking and having and it's amazing that they can idolize those players and they may aspire to be athletes, but the vast percentage of us aren't going to be an elite athlete. And so it's very important for us in our junior player development programs or our basketball hoops programs that these kids have fun, engage with the sport, but also have realistic and, and really connected expectations. And uh, the, the head of our, of, uh, or the director of our community relations program, she's an African-American female and she's from New Orleans. So I'm so proud of having her there to speak to these young kids because the boys and girls can identify with her. And Rita and I were talking earlier too about how we can use our sport and also um, our businesses to be able to educate. And there's so many educational opportunities that make you know, reading and writing and math, and engineering just a little bit sexier to the students as they go, go forward. So we have programs as well, and I know Rita does, but we're very proud of that, and ha we had a chance to talk about it earlier, so it was fun to compare notes. Well, they have STEM, mm -hmm. and, we, and one of our sponsors added an A for the arts, so we have STEAM in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's just the commonality of sports and focusing on science, technology, um, I should, mm -hmm. I should remember them better, but, but in, in mathematics and all the, all the things that they should be learning, but to use that in sports examples. So in NASCAR, they use the car, and mm -hmm. in our new renovations for the Smoothie King Center, we use the football examples. So it's the sneakers and the, tech, um, and the technology in that, and then just the leap and showing what the players can do and what these kids can do. So, but sp sports is such a unifying element. Clearly, we all watch it, but it's, it's, it's expanding your program so that that touch comes home. And I think because you're focused so much on the game a lot of times, that's a very masculine thing as far as competition and winning and being aggressive to hit the top. 
whereas with females or feminine traits, you tend to be more collaborative. So, um, but you want to win too. I have. We want to win. But <laughs> when, when you're in it as long as we are, there are a lot of people who win, and you have to be happy with the mm -hmm. with the experience that you offer. And so, Lisa, mm -hmm. you might want to talk to that. It is more entertainment than sports these days. Yeah, yes. is that right? I mean, is, is it sports as an entertainment? I mean, what's, what's the balance? I mean, well, it's obviously these are athletes. These it, are, you know. it is, and it, it's um, obviously both. I think it was really more sports-focused before, but we're having an opportunity to take our facilities and expand on them. For instance, in Daytona, which is the home of the Daytona 500, we're putting $400 million into totally renovating the facility. So we're not thinking about just racing anymore, which is our bread and butter but also about what other events that we can put on that will be great for the business, great for the fan, and also drive economic impact for our community. And we've had such a positive reaction so far. We're going to open in February of 2016, and the plans are so exciting, and we'll really be able to open up to concerts. Some of our other tracks have wine festivals, all kinds of charitable events, uh, walks on the track, for instance, to raise money. But we'll continue to uh, expand even more with those entertainment options. And you did this in Kansas City, and you started the, mm -hmm. the, the Kansas Speedway. And, and this was uh, something that required some you know, public funding, a lot of public funding up front. And I imagine there might have been you know, some questions about that. But how, what, what impact has that had on the economic vitality of what was a, 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 a region mm -hmm. that was really depressed? Well, we opened um, our track, the Kansas Speedway, in 2001, and lo and behold, we learned, and we had a great partner with the state of Kansas and also with the Wyandotte County. So we got together and we figured out there was a blighted area, and it was going backwards, I mean, rapidly backwards. It was just, there was nothing there whatsoever. There was only $265,000 a year that they were collecting in taxes from that property and the surrounding area. Today, after we've built the racetrack yeah. and all the other development that sprung up around it, we now have a casino. We're getting ready to build a hotel. There's a, a whole Village West um, uh, area development that's right around the racetrack. Twelve million visitors a year now come to a place where nobody visited before. But we went from $265,000 annually to $65 million in taxes today, and we're yeah. very, very proud of that, not just for NASCAR and for our business, but for what the community has done, how they've embraced us, and it's really a, a story of how you can be successful if you partner together and all have the same vision. So, Rita, t tell us the, the story. It's a, it's a, there, there's some commonalities, but it, it, one of the most dramatic sports and business and community was, of course, Katrina. Uh, we, we all watched as Katrina hit your city, and you know, just w what was the state of your team, of your stadium, which we all saw, uh, and, and how did how did you, you know, in short, lead that comeback? It was insanely traumatic. Um, if I'm doing a speaking and we have the video behind me, even though I'm not watching it, I can hear it, and I still choke up. So yeah. it was it was very very emotional. Um, at the time, really just collaborating and listening to experts, participating with some of the business peer groups that I was a part of. Uh, I was counseled that you would have an increase instances in, in domestic violence and drug and alcohol abuse because all these people are going through a trauma and they've never collectively done that. And then everyone was dramatically pulled from their homes. Uh, so it was, it was very, very traumatic. You, you couldn't really talk about what you, you knew what you hoped to do and accomplish, but decisions for people that could handle the situation became very finite. You could only do what was possible. And one of the things that we were very fortunate is that our governor, Kathleen Blanco, had the vision that all, the Superdome had become pretty much a symbol of destruction and pain and those problems, but that was the biggest thing that if we put it back together, when everyone was thinking that we would not be able to, that that would be a testament to what our community could accomplish together. And it truly was. Um, and we had the promise and the commitment of a lot of people. We had investment from the NFL owners as far as for the gaps. It was a constant promise process as to what was FEMA and what was insurance. Um, I know it's kind of long-winded, but it was so much time and effort. But, but our entire community succeeded when the game started. Uh, so, um, and then we won and we beat the Falcons. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, but, yeah. You know, we won the Super Bowl. We've had a lot of milestones as a community, but pretty much everyone who was involved with that game says that that was the most impactful experience that they'd had in sports or their careers or anything, just to be a part of it. 
Um, so I'm, I'm deeply proud of that. And that, has, that, that was the, the step to get it back on our feet and talk about what we could do. And, and in our public-private partnerships, there was some property adjacent to the Superdome that had, was blighted about three years after Katrina. It was still empty. It was an office tower, a mall, and, and um, some other retail and parking. And rather than having a direct government subsidy, we got very creative in our conversations. The state was going to invest in a $110 million building to, to collectively bring back state agencies together. Instead of doing that, we invested our dollars in returning the blight into commerce, and therefore they gave us a long-term lease agreement on all that state office space. So that was an integral key to our long-term lease agreement in that facility. Um, as we put everything back together and we invested in our city, we attracted Mercedes-Benz to be the naming rights sponsor for our facility. And that was just another milestone of authentication that a world-class brand felt that our building was that brand new and that world-class. But bring us back to those discussions as the, the, the city's just devastated. Uh, the Superdome is the symbol that it had become. Was there, was there any, were there any voices saying, you know what, maybe we should just move to an entirely different location? This is, I mean, I, from a strict bottom line sense, did it make sense? It made sense because people were there, but yeah. it, was, it was a very difficult um, media conversation to have daily because I yeah. was being asked by people, why are you back? And I was like, because we're committed. And they're like, well, why would you go back? And so I knew that whatever played well was what was, what was going to get covered. But you had to send messages to all the people that you worked with that we all had to be there. And everyone from every socioeconomic background was forced to leave or had to go away for a bit at some point. And yet we all made a financial commitment to go and be there. And it was not easy, but we had to have people. First of all, you had to have a building. So the first year, you know, you, you actually you had to set the schedule for the NFL. So the first year, obviously, we were, we were away and we were in multiple different locations. But knowing that people were there and also that the companies were there, we didn't truly have Nielsen ratings. We had, didn't have a per capita. It was very difficult for companies to make decisions as to what they would do and whether they could function. Not just their will, but also did they have employees or, or people to, to be their customers. Uh, but we had our season ticket holders stepped up and we were sold out before the start of that next season. And so that was the one fact that we could yeah. say, you know, 72,000 people are planning to be there for 10 home games. You better be ready. <laughs> right. So, so um, you know, we were a symbol, we were a catalyst, we did everything we could to be ambassadors for our community. And we're, we're happy, we're, we're home where we are. And, um, and then the, the Hornets were, uh, they were displaced. We didn't own the team at the time. We acquired the team in 2012 of July. So I'm a new NBA owner. And um, there are some familiar faces in that room. And both leagues have a completely different evolutionary phase, but we all consistently are committed and determined to help support uh, New Orleans. It's a great global cultural city. And, and yeah, well, it's, one of, it's it. one of the great stories. And, and Kansas and Daytona, uh, uh, looking forward to see what happens down there. Uh, really a pleasure to talk to both of you. And um, I hope to, to see you at a game and see Absolutely. you at a, at a race. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much.